Well, good morning, everyone. Well, good morning. That is, if you're joining us from Australia um, or the Asian region, and uh, good afternoon or good evening if uh, you're in the United States. It's um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. My name is Michael Dejuani. I'm a professor in digital media and learning at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia, and it's uh, my absolute pleasure to uh, moderate this session today, this keynote presentation to be presented by um, Lucy Pangrazio. Uh, I would like to just start by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the lands where I'm meeting from today, the Turrbal and Yagara. Um, in Australia, we like to acknowledge um, our traditional owners um, and just acknowledge that the lands we're meeting on uh, remain unceded territory. And I would like to acknowledge um, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so uh, welcome to this Connected Learning Summit keynote presentation. Uh, we um, have a survey that we would like you to complete. Uh, so uh, these details will also be shared with you on the Hoover platform. So if you don't get them quite now, that's okay. Um, but you could if you've got your phone handy, you could scan the QR code. Uh, we'd just like some feedback about how the, um, the conference has gone for you this year. Uh, I want to acknowledge the hosts of this year's Connected Learning Summit um, who are on the screen there. Uh, several organizations come together to, to put this on each year. And uh, I'd like to um, thank the committee that has worked hard to bring this year's uh, summit together as well. And again, names on the screen and, and the staff um, who have worked hard behind the scenes as well to um, make all of this possible. And a whole bunch of volunteers as well. So as you can see, it takes a lot of people to, to pull something like this together. Uh, if you um, need anything on the Hoover platform, don't forget that you can click the Ask Organizers Anything tab on the left-hand side, and then that will take you through to our volunteer assistants who can help you with um, any technical issues you have or finding sessions and so on. So I'd like to now uh, introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Lucy Pangrazio, whose topic will be Making the Familiar Strange, Critical Digital Literacies for EdTech. And uh, Dr. Pangrazio is an Australian Research Council DECRA Fellow, uh, Chief Investigator in the um, ARC Centre of Excellence for the Digital Child, and a Senior Lecturer in Language and Literacy at Deakin University in Melbourne. Her research focuses on digital and data literacies, datafication in the home and school, and the politics of digital platforms. And uh, she's uh, published some really fantastic recent books that um, you really should read. Uh, Critical Data Literacies, uh, published with MIT Press in 2023, uh, Learning to Live with Datafication, and Young People's Literacies in the Digital Age. Um, and so I'm about to hand over to, to Lucy, but I also wanted to say that we'll have a, a kind of interactive part to this session today, and uh, we'll be asking you to vote on some topics. So look out in the uh, chat for uh, how to vote on, on the topics that Lucy will outline. And uh, so I'll hand over to you, Lucy. Great, thanks, Michael. I'll just share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> Is that okay? Everyone can see that? Yes, that's great. Okay, so thanks so much, Michael, for the introduction. Um, it really is a great honour to be um, presenting this afternoon, oh, this morning, sorry, I should say, on this afternoon. Um, it's it's a great honour to be here, um, and I really wish I could have uh, participated a little more over the last couple of days, but I've actually been unwell, so... Um, I hope that I can make some meaningful contributions um, this morning. So my talk today is called Making the Familiar Strange. And the reason I've called it this is because while I was preparing for today, I remembered a quote from author David Foster Wallace, who made a speech to a graduating class back in 2005. And his quote went a little like this. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? 
And the two young fish swim on for a bit. And then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? Now, it struck me that digital technologies are so much a part of the schooling experience today that they have become the water we swim in. They are really now our medium for learning. But they've also slipped into the technological unconscious so that we tend not to sort of stand back and just ask, how is the water? So my point today is that by defamiliarising these everyday technologies, we can really start to see them with fresh eyes and see both the challenges and the opportunities that they present. So schools are now literally dripping with technology. Schoolwork is completed on commercial platforms owned by Google and Microsoft. Student behaviours are monitored through apps such as Class Dojo. Facial recognition technologies are used to record attendance and cameras and sensors are used to secure classrooms and school grounds. School administration also takes place through a whole additional ecosystem of apps and platforms. So, so ubiquitous are these technologies that we tend not to see them anymore. They have become the sea we swim in. At the same time, these ed tech platforms are not without problems. The issues around privacy, algorithmic bias, the intensification of inequality and the commercialization of our public school systems. So while we may accept that digital technologies have become integral to schools and learning, and they certainly do improve access and innovate learning, it is really high time we stood back to ask, how's the water? So, sorry, um, in this talk, I wanna make strange what we know and think about ed tech. And my overriding argument is that we really need to think critically and carefully about these digital technologies that we use for learning. And that means considering their wider impact on the culture of the school and the relationship between teachers and students. So drawing on my research projects over the last 10 years, I wanna sketch out a picture of what we know about digital technologies in schools. And there are four projects that I wanna draw on throughout this talk. The first was a two year project looking at new ways to materialize data in order to develop critical understandings of data and digital technologies. Now, the second was a three year project based in school investigating the data in schools and how we could support schools to enhance their use of it. Now, the third is related to my work in the Center of Excellence um, for the Digital Child. And here I'm interested in the digital technologies and data um, in the homes of families with children aged zero to eight. And this really gives us some indication of the dispositions and practices young people might be coming to schools and learning with. And the final project is one I've just started um, and is looking at the kind of broader context for the datafication of education. So starting with the school, but then looking at the wider kind of assemblage of actors that come together to um, uh, sort of broker technologies. Um, so I'm thinking here of policymakers, professional networks, um, and other intermediaries. Now you may have noticed that data is a common theme throughout these projects. And this is because many of the challenges um, and I guess opportunities as well associated with digital technologies in schools are really associated with digital data. Now schools have long kept um, records or data of student progress and attendance, but digital technologies have greatly increased the scope of what can be datafied in schools. So now we have digital records on a whole host of things from things we might expect like attendance and grades um, through to a whole range of other things like the room use, air quality, and whether students are even on task. But to study data, we also need to know something about the tech in school so we can look at both together. So the next part of this talk is a bit like a choose your own adventure as Michael mentioned. Um, and I've broken up the findings across the projects into different areas. And some, some of these have been published in articles and there's sort of seven topics um, for us to consider today. Um, so the, uh, before doing that, I just want to add that these are um, qualitative studies and they're not really, they're not generalizable or across all contexts, of course, but they do let us test the water and get a feel for the issues and challenges that are emerging. 
Um, so the first of this is what, what types of data in schools and how and why it's important. We come to grips with this. The second topic is around um, the digital infrastructures in schools. And it's kind of a mapping that might give you some sense of the complexity involved, including the manual labour that is required to make a system work. And that's manual labour often of teachers. The third is about the different technologies in the home. Um, the fourth is about the ways in which teachers use data in schools to develop judgments, narratives and ideas about students. Um, the fifth is around whose data, uh, who does data in schools, that is like who actually is responsible for the kind of processing and analysis of data in schools and the new kinds of power that emerge through that. The seventh is around how students feel about certain types of software and so often we are using technologies in schools without really asking young people themselves what it feels like to be using this technology. And, uh, and in my case, I was particularly interested in how they feel about the kind of datafication that goes along with that. And the final one is how EdTech initiates new literacies for teachers um, and students and how this can lead to new forms of educational governance. So the last two of these are a bit longer um, and depending on what we choose, we might have time for three or four. So um, let me know what you would like to hear or if Michael has a... a, a... Lu Lucy, I, yeah, Lucy, I think um, number two, the platform platformization of education is um, coming up as, as a key one. Um, yeah. And then actually number six, student experiences of school-based datafication. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think, oh, gee, the votes are kind of jumping around a little bit, but I'd probably have to say number uh, five. Oh, no, hang on. Well, that's okay because we can actually come back. I, okay. I, I'll come oh. back to this page. So we can do two and six and then see if we've got time for another one. Okay. Thanks, Michael. All right, so let's go with two. Okay, so obviously now most of us know there is a multi-billion dollar edtech industry um, that is in the business of designing and selling platforms to schools. And these platforms cover just about every aspect of, from, of school life, from teaching and learning, communicating with parents, to even running the tuck shop. So what sorts of platforms are actually in schools and what can this tell us about their digital infrastructure? There is, of course, a very close relationship between platforms and data. After all, platforms are integral to generating and formatting data, so they essentially work fist in glove. Now, following a lot of theoretical literature on platformization, what we expected to find when we were investigating the infrastructures in schools was a little bit different to what we anticipate anticipated. So rather than a few big platforms, we actually found it was a rather kind of ad hoc patchwork of platforms. But before I sort of tell you about the findings, I just want to give you some background on how we um, investigated this. And the reason for this is because we weren't just interested in mapping the kind of apps and platforms. We were also interested in the ways the social relationships and policies um, and school values also shaped these. So I'm going to show you some maps, but behind this was a whole body of work on um, why these maps looked as they did. So we did, um, we conducted semi-structured interviews that lasted between 30 and 90 minutes with school staff. Technical staff at each school also mapped out these data maps, um, showing um, their understanding of the different platforms and the systems in the school and how they interoperate or not, as the case may be. And then we did um, walkthroughs of the school to identify features of the built environment that helped to provide the digital infra infrastructures of the school. So what did we find? Well, the school digital infrastructures um, are essentially a kind of patchwork of platforms. They're they're developed in quite a, an ad hoc way. So the school is kind of like this patchwork stitched together by a lot of manual labour. And this really highlights the underlying socio-technical conditions under which schools now operate. Now, these include issues of limited inter technical interoperability and differences between educational requirements and commercially led designs. Now, also apparent was this disjunct disjuncture between the imagined benefits of institutional data use 
and the ongoing behind the scenes maintenance and repair work required to keep school infrastructures functioning. So this is a legend for the different types of digital infrastructures that we have found in our three schools. And you can see from here, we had really good reason to call these digital infrastructures a kind of patchwork. So it was software for school management, school operations for doing work, but then there was a whole bunch of other technologies used to make that system work. So software for converging data, mirroring platforms, um, and also a whole lot of um, devices for monitoring the network. So this is a map um, that we created for one of our schools and Brookdale um, was a private school in suburban Melbourne. Um, and it used multiple systems to monitor the network and manage data. For example, the school was using ClearPass and Active Directory to connect devices to the network. Interestingly, it had three systems uh, for converging data. And one thing that was of particular interest to us was this Octopus BI. And we're seeing this more and more in in schools now is this business intelligence um, or business analytics platforms to help schools and teach, teachers make sense of all the data that is being collected. Um, and in many ways, this was representing a bit of a problem because um, the school uh, had different requirements for data, but the, the technology was actually providing a kind of different version. So there was this kind of um, not matching up between the technologies and perhaps the aspirations of the staff. Um, in many cases, it was like this uh, a situation in which um, the technology was acquired to fulfill more niche kind of needs of the schools. And in particular with this school being a private school, a lot of this was about communicating to parents and presenting a particular view of the school. Um, and also there was a, a driving need for hyper-convergence because as I was saying before, this interoperability was emerging as a real challenge. So just some questions that came out of this work. Um, and one thing to say, each of the school's digital infrastructures are very much in flux with new components being regularly added um, due to our sort of technological upgrades and then other specific needs of the school. And often older components remained in the infrastructure after old data was migrated across, but it kind of sat there as sort of a legacy piece of software, lending this kind of sedimentary nature to these infrastructures. So a few questions coming out of this were, um, how do institutional protocols and procedures shape how platforms are used in schools and other institutions? And another interesting finding was the school management system, uh, which was typically a, a, a platform like Moodle or um, a school box, was typically the installed base that everything else had to be built around. Now, Benjamin Bratton refers to this as generative entrenchment, um, where a platform's early consolidation of a system decreases that cost of future investment. So once that that base or the LMS is um, being chosen, then that kind of limits what the school can um, choose to, to, to use as a learning software or other software on top of that, because it needs to interoperate. So we had schools where those two systems weren't interoperating at all, which meant that the manual labor for the LMS to talk to the kind of everyday uh, teaching and learning technologies was often like requiring a lot of, of extra teach time. So we were interested in, or a question that might be interesting, that would be good to take up into the future is who makes decisions about which platforms are installed and on what, what basis? Uh, and finally, um, this is common with platforms for organizing manage, and managing work. Um, we found that teachers felt they had to comply with the structural demands of their school's management platforms and systems. And this is what um, Ajunwa and Green call um, the platform playing a supervisory role. So teachers need to make sure that their practices were platform ready, um, which leads to this kind of idea of management by platforms or um, what Ajumwa calls um, platform, authoritarian, uh, platform authoritarianism. So a final question might be, how do platforms in schools reconfigure teacher and administrators work? What supports are in place to help them to learn and to use and integrate these into their practice. So I'll go back to um, 
uh, the, the slide. And I think, Mark, you said number six, which I've numbered incorrectly here, but is seven, student experience of school-based datafication. Yep, that's right. Yep. Okay. Okie dokes. So <clears throat> what do young people think about the ways that technologies are used in schools? Now, too often, uh, children and young people have data done to them without actually thinking about how it's changing, how they feel about school learning and each other. Now, we know that data privacy is a legal issue, and many of you would have read the or heard of the findings of the Human Rights Watch report that came out last year that showed that many of the edtech uh, platforms being used in schools are jeopardising young people's privacy, uh, with many of them sending data back to Google and Facebook. So there's that set of issues. And um, But in this uh, area, we were really interested in how they feel about how data is being used in schools. And we're often thinking about data in terms of teacher labour. And this, I'm talking here about the academic kind of work. We've we think about data in terms of teacher labour, improving school performance or accountability, or improving personalised learning. But we rarely stop and think about what students themselves might think about, think and feel about how data is used. So we spoke to over 40 students across three schools to ask what they feel, think and feel about how data is being used in schools. And while our findings were quite concerning, unfortunately, they're not surprising. So first, students have a keen sense of data being used to monitor or track them across school and home. So students at Brookdale mentioned that if they logged onto the school system from home, then it was likely the teacher might think they were not concentrating in class. As this student said, they also track you if you're using Brookcom uh, in the evening or later or after school, they can figure out that you're probably doing some work that you didn't finish in class. Now, it's not surprising that one student um, at Northland thought this tracking would continue even after they've left the school. As he says, when you're like at another school, they can still track you down. Now, whether this is true is somewhat beside the point. The, the, the issue here is that the student carries with them that feeling of being tracked and monitored, and that has the power to change how they feel about school and learning. Students also have this sense of powerlessness and resignation when it comes to school data. So when it comes to non-school data, and here I'm thinking about um, social media data, students described a couple of strategies for keeping their data safe. And this might be using a fake name or a nickname or entering a different year of birth into their profile. However, when it came to school data, there was much less sense of control. Um, here students felt subordinated in two ways, not only as a student in the school who was required to conform to the rules and regulations, but also as a user of digital media who knew little about who or what was interested in their data and how it was being used. Now this culminated in some quite dramatic descriptions, such as this one from the student at Northland, who described the school system as if there was an FBI agent on the other side of the computer screen. Now, many at Western were not concerned just about the amount of data being collected, but also who had access to it. So in particular, the fact that school data could be accessed by teachers who did not have a direct relationship with the student was a real source of concern. As this student says, I don't trust everyone in the school, or I don't need every single teacher, a teacher that has never had me before, knowing my information. Students also acknowledge that they had little say in the data that was made public. Now, as one student at Northland explained, because the school restricts their access to the information, their mobile phone number, which was printed on their, their profile, remained there for all to see. So students at Northland felt, also felt frustrated by the fact that they could not change their profile photo, which again was publicly dis displayed. Now, while this might seem a relatively minor point, it really con contributed to this feeling of disempowerment and resignation that students felt about how school data was being used, which in some situations led to real feelings of frustration and embarrassment. Um, but most students believe that school data will have an impact on their future and particularly their university applications and employment. 
Um, and we're not just talking about end of year, like the final year data, but data all the way through their schooling lives. So as one student from Northland explained, it affects your whole life basically because they're keeping a record of every single thing you do at school. Other students thought future employees and the government would also be interested in their school data, mainly because the information would be so easy to find. Now, again, in Victoria, this is not true. Schools are bound by privacy policies of the Department of Education, which is governed by the Privacy and Data Protection Act. But for us as researchers, again, this interesting point was that students believed it to be true. And this tells us that there is a fair bit of education that really needs to take place about what school data can does and does not do now and in their future lives. When we asked students how data could be done differently in the future, students really struggled to think, think um, beyond those standard ways that data was currently being used. And that's not really surprising given that um, this lack of agency and kind of sense of control that was coming out through our interviews with them. So when it comes to data in schools, students really concerned about being tracked and monitored online and unsure about how it's being used and who could access it. But they're also aware of the fact that the strategies they use to protect and manage their non-school data would not work in schools. They're also concerned by the fact that this data will stay with them well into the future. So when applying for universities or jobs um, so in our quest to kind of monitor and chart every aspect of students' learning lives, and that's certainly something that I'm still finding in this most recent project in schools, that there is this need to kind of track and monitor students across all subjects and when they're attending, um, we are perhaps damaging the very thing required to realise their potential, and that is their agency and self-determination. So in, conclu in conclusion, there are two main areas of further research, which I think would be helpful here. And first is to ensure that we are designing and developing innovative ed tech that does not jeopardize um, privacy of our children and young people. And teachers and schools play a really um, important role in driving this change and being better informed and able to say no to some of that technology that really does change the water or breach our children's digital rights. But second, we need to build children and young people's understandings of how school data is used and importantly, how it is not being used. So we know when there's a gap in understanding, people really tend to assume the worst. And this is quite evident in our findings. So I'll head back to the menu and we've probably got time for one more. Well, Lucy, Lucy, the other one was the soft power one. Okay, this is a slightly longer one, um, and we're finishing at 11.30, that's right, isn't it? So Yes, yes, okay. that's right. Okay. Um, so as part of this um, sort of uh, area, we were interested in understanding how um, the, the impact of this new uh, class of software that's being used in schools, which is student monitoring software. It's becoming really popular, uh, particularly after the pandemic, when schools were wanting to monitor what students were doing online. It's, it's increasingly popular in Australia and overseas. Um, so we were interested in this area, not just on the privacy stuff, but also how it's changing what we think of as digital literacies in schools. So let me introduce you to one example of this monitoring software, and this is Study Screen. This is a pseudonym. Um, and you might have already seen things like this already. Uh, it's just one example um, of these products on the market. Others are Dino, Go Guardian, and Securely. Um, and now study screen and companies like it represent a class um, of software that monitor and scan and filter student and teachers online interactions so that it will monitor learning, help students that are at risk, empower teachers and keep students safe. But despite the hype, we found quite a lot to be concerned by, and that's not just how it's shaping um, classroom practices, but also digital literacies. 
So study screen, um, just to give you a bit of background, is this automated monitoring system that provides teachers with live updates of students' laptop activity, so in the classroom live. And it will show basically whether a student is on task, which is green, off task, which is red, or sort of unsure, which is amber. And you can see on the left, I've taken a, a grab of one of these dashboards. So this is what the teacher can see. Now, class data can be aggregated as well to give the teacher feedback on their lessons. So they can then gauge which lessons were boring because a lot of students were off task um, or uh, also just to kind of monitor the student across the term as well. So you can get um, a readout of how on task they were across time. So what did the teachers think about study screen? Well, interestingly, some of the teachers didn't even notice that this was a problem um, until uh, they got study screen. So as this teacher, Kath, says, I didn't know I wanted it until I got it. And this way, study screen is simultaneously introducing the problem and solving it all in one. But several teachers like Rick were just confused about how it actually worked. But probably the most um, talked about issue was that it just wasn't accurate. So study screen would often flag students as off task when they were often on task. For example, if students were asked to research a topic and they were looking at something on YouTube, study screen would label them off task. Now, interestingly, the Director of Teacher and Learning at one of the schools stressed in his introduction the importance of being uh, critical and not to just blindly trust the colours. So, um, however, this this really re re meant teachers um, needed to rely on checking with the student, the website, and then potentially labelling it as on task. So we were interested in how this kind of process actually reframed what it means to be critical. It actually kind of meant working more closely with the platform to interpret what it was telling you. Um, and as uh, John mentioned then, that that the a, a further problem is this uh, kind of lack of training um, and education required on, on top of the normal requirements of a teacher to make this work. Um, and it was indeed clear to us that additional digital literacies um, and classroom practices were, were required um, to rectify some of the perceptions about students that were being perpetuated through this technology. Another issue was that while teachers could watch the students, they were also well aware of the fact that they themselves could also be watched. So when study screen was introduced, Tom went to great lengths to say, this will not be used to judge you. But then later on, he would he said, um, I thought I was a, a, a good teacher until I saw this. And then I realised I'd been in a retreat and my students were here with a relief teacher. But what he didn't even seem to realise was that was a form of teacher judgment and it was already taking place. And this was confirmed in other interviews by John, who said even just knowing basically that this exists and that it can happen is a way of kind of changing um, or framing, uh, we're not looking at you, but we could, it's a way of nudging you to think that, that they possibly are. So it's inevitable that a program like Study Screen is strongly shaping of teachers' practices. So just very quickly, um, the students um, also had thoughts about Study Screen um, and a couple of students felt that it should be used differentially, so only used on the bad students, but not, not the good students. Um, but perhaps most importantly, again, they felt like teachers no longer trust you. So there's this sense that you're getting along with the teacher, they trust you, but then you know that they're looking at your history and looking at what you're going on and when you're going on it. So in addition, this kind of technology might be encouraging students to look more closely at what others in the class were doing. So there were some reports about and making sure that the student was punished if they were off task. So we might ask, what does this do for classroom camaraderie? So what does this tell us about um, digital literacy and the use of contemporary ed tech? Now, our founding suggests that the discourse that surrounds these technologies are clearly significant in shaping the digital literacies and practices of different actors in the school. So teachers and students often have very little choice um, in the types of platforms they use. And if they chose not to use them, then they were often viewed in a 
sort of quite an unfavourable light. So as a Luddite, as if they had something to hide, as if they were not caring of their students. Also evident is that those in the school who were responsible for purchasing these technologies have a kind of vested interest in making them work. And this is often to do with contracts associated with these, um, this software that can be really hard to get for schools to get out of. So a, a kind of future question might be, um, are they able to, are school leaders genuinely able to see this kind of technology critically? Um, it also paves the way for new forms of data violence in schools and it increases labors for, labor for teachers um, and an increased uh, lack of trust between students and teachers as well. Finally, time was to get a school-based digital literacies appear to be being shaped through these platforms. So to be digitally literate with study screen, teachers had to understand its data dashboard as well as reinterpreting student behaviours in light of the dashboard visualisations. So their notions of what it means to be digitally literate were at once kind of expanded in order to make sense of all these sort of different things, but also con contracted as it was dictated along the lines of the platform. So to use study screen properly, essentially meant getting on board with how it approached teaching, learning and assessment. So one of our key takeaways from this study was that without the lubricant of digital literacies, that without a conceptualization of how reading, writing and understanding take place about through this software, um, you can't really use it. And this leaves us with the question of are digital literacies becoming a soft power for educational governance? And if they are, what are we going to do about it? How can we reclaim digital literacies to ensure that they are not co-opted for ed tech by ed tech companies to enable this kind of seamless flow of data into and out of our schools? And finally, how do teachers maintain criticality when they are continually told to get on board with whatever software monitoring or learning management program they're being asked to use. So for the last part of the talk, I just um, wanted to uh, provide a, a bit of a manifesto for action. So what we can actually do about this. Um, so I'm gonna skip to that now, but just looking at, um, and I hope I haven't come across as too negative, but that's certainly not my intention, but. I guess my point today was we know EdTech can do a lot of good things and, and I'm sure a lot of that has been shared across um, the last couple of days. But I think it's really important that we're cognizant of the other things that it changes. The things that perhaps we don't tend to notice but can actually change the temperature of the water, so to speak. So having taken you on a little tour of um, my research over the last few years, several persistent issues seem to emerge here, including the increased surveillance via data or data valence of students and teachers, the reshaping of literacies by ed tech platforms, or the potential for that, um, the influence of big tech on schools and education systems, and finally, the fact that expertise with digital technologies and data in schools is entwined with new forms of power and career pro progression, which was another one of my little subtopics. So now more than ever, it is essential that we stand back and ask how we can ensure digital learning is better for children and young people. So I wanna to conclude today's talk by providing a way of organizing our responses to some of these persistent challenges while also advocating for a literacies approach to evaluating ed tech as texts for deconstruction and critical evaluation. So how can we organize our thoughts? It's all very well to say we just need to be more critical, um, but what does that actually mean in practice? There's so many approaches and activities um, today, but I wanna sort of provide a kind of overview of some of the key things that I think might be helpful, um, but of course, open uh, to hear your thoughts on this as well. So um, it's really important that we research these platforms so that we understand the risks and opportunities we are introducing ourselves and our students to when we use them. And I'm talking here about the privacy stuff. We also need to educate children um, and young people about these very digital platforms to start a kind of critical conversation 
We also need to become activists who resist using these kind of pernicious technologies. If we don't agree with them, then we shouldn't just go along with it. If we know that they are collecting children's data and using it in um, a range of unsavoury ways, then we should um, resist using them. And finally, we need to get creative to reimagine and redesign how ed tech could be done better. So first, to the education, uh, sorry, is the researching some of these digital platforms. Now, one um, really uh, interesting place to start is conducting an ed tech audit. Now, the Civics of Tech Group are based in the US, and some of you may know them. They have a whole range of resources for teachers to use, and I want to draw your attention to their technology audit and specifically their five critical questions about tech. And I would argue that we need these questions to be asked by educators and adults who work with children and young people, but perhaps more importantly, we need to um, really get the people who are procuring this technology to ask these questions as well. So if we were to apply these questions, say, to study smart that I was just talking about and think about what does society give up for the benefit of the technology, well, first we could say that the school had to preload the software onto a compatible device. So perhaps they're giving up a particular type of um, operating system. Second, the teachers gave up class time talking to students as this is replaced by making sense of the study screen dashboard. And of course, the teachers might've seen from the outset that students and teachers are also giving up their privacy. Um, perhaps in asking number four, uh, what are the unintended or unexpected changes caused by the technology? Again, if we apply that to study screen, we might find that the erosion of trust uh, or between student and teacher. And what does that actually do for classroom relations? Now, these conversations um, perhaps should have taken place not before or not long after study screen was installed and they might have changed the way this unfolded in that particular context. But there are a lot of other tools that are helpful and you're probably aware of some of these, but just to give you a couple of examples, um, Terms of Service Didn't Read uh, basically summarises all the problematic aspects of terms and conditions agreements and then grades the websites accordingly. I love that one, like it gives Facebook, um, I think an F and it tells you why. The second is Blacklight, which is a website privacy in inspector. And with Blacklight, you can enter the address of any website and it will scan it and reveal the specific user tracking technologies on the site. Now, the, what I've included up there are the results for the Australian newspaper. And you can see that it's got a, quite a high number of ad trackers and third party cookies, but it's also using a session recorder. So it's tracking user mouse movement, clicks, taps, scrolls, or even um, network activity. Now, there are a lot of free tools that we can use, and these are not magic bullets, but it's about building awareness and of developing a lot of critical conversations around these tools so they create a kind of discourse amongst educators and edtech researchers. Now, the second dimension is educating children and young people about how digital platforms work. Um, and critique, I think you have to say or um, acknowledge, does not come naturally for all. And it's really something that we need to kind of explicitly scaffold with our young people. Now, this is um, anatomy of a digital platform from Jose van Dijk and, and colleagues. And I, I like this because it breaks down our thinking around the platform into a range of different aspects. So the fact that they're fueled by data, they're automated through algorithms and interfaces, formalized through ownership relations and shareholder agreements and driven by business models um, and governed by user agreements. Now, just as we teach students how essays, poems, films and books are structured, why not teach our young people and ourselves at the same time, let's be honest, to con critically consider how these digital technologies are structured. So even just starting with the interface is a very simple activity. We could start to analyze with young people, um, the layout, the use of images, colors and text of their most used platforms. So we might ask things like, why do platform operators choose to use the colors they do? For a while there, blue was just everywhere. You know, a lot of the social media platforms were blue. Why blue? Let's do some research on that. Why are images given such priority on the page? 
what do metric platform metrics tell us about what is valued by this particular platform. And part of this could be developing understandings of how digital content is presented and circulated online, and therefore analysing the function of platform mechanisms like hashtags, likes and metrics, and progressing to include perhaps more complex hidden things such as the role of algorithms and data. Now, young people already know a lot of these things implicitly, but the benefit of bringing these things out into the open um, and to be discussed and examined collectively cannot be underestimated. And related to this is really providing that time and space. Now, as part of the um, Data Smart Schools project, we developed a set of free resources for educators to use, and I'm more than happy to um, send these out to anyone who's interested. And as you can see here, we covered quite a bit of ground um, around knowing your data, data uses, data privacy, and also school data, what I was talking about before, the importance of kind of reassuring students about the ways that data is not being used in schools. But the civics of tech website have um, lots of other great resources as well. It's really just about, I guess, shifting the con conversation to include some of these more critical perspectives. But in addition to these educational responses, um, which are kind of uh, categorised as sort of bottom-up responses, there's also um, top-down responses that um, it's important to be aware of. It's helpful to know the laws that can support us in our quest to protect ours and our children and young people's digital rights. Um, now in Australia, um, the Privacy Act is currently being reviewed um, and we're hopeful that a lot of those changes will um, come into place because it was written in 1988, which was two years before the CEO of Snapchat was born. So we really do need an update on that. Um, but I would encourage you to, to perhaps look at what kinds of regulations might support some of, um, you know, these it will support you to perhaps resist uh, in, in having to take up some of these technologies which are becoming more and more prevalent. Um, and by, I guess by being an activist, I'm not asking it, um, you know, to break the law or anything like that, but it's just about raising awareness of these issues and lobbying hard to protect our children and young people. So in Europe, several countries like France and Norway have banned Microsoft and Google because these companies do not protect children's data. So through the general data protection regulation and the consciousness raising a law like this brings, Europe is kind of leading the way when it comes to the resistance of big, big tech and ed tech. So the collectivity could in fact be the most powerful weapon at our disposal. Because after all, if a state or district refuses to endorse a piece of software, that we don't have, then we don't have to worry about the ways in which it breaches data privacy or the new kinds of digital literacies it invokes, because it just won't be allowed. Now, finally, um, I just want to advocate for educators to be creative in their approach to using techno digital technology, um, and just say that we don't need to use it in ways that are intended by the company. And, and I'm sure that. Um, across the last couple of days, there have been lots of examples of that. But one creative project that I thought I would share with you today is by Ben Grosser. And I love this because it's called the Demetricator. It basically removes all the metrics from social media um, and really disrupts the kind of obsession that we have with metrics. So we can reveal perhaps how they guide our behaviour and ask questions about who benefits from a system that quantifies um, our public interactions online. This could be a great little project to do with students. So just in bringing all of this together, um, uh, the literacies that are required to, to really think critically about the ed tech platforms in our schools are collective rather than individual, the active rather than passive, exploratory rather than instrumentalist and creative rather than quantitative. We know ed tech is here to stay and indeed it brings with it lots of good. Um, but we also need to try to make sure that these technologies are not breaching privacy, they're not changing um, teaching and learning in ways that are detrimental and that they really are respecting the rights um, of our young people. 
So through research, education, activism and redesign, we can disrupt, resist and reinvent the technologies that are often created for us rather than with us. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I would love to hear any questions, comments and ideas. And I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm also happy to share any publications or resources that I have created that would be of assistance to people. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was an absolutely um, fantastic um, presentation. And um, I am just in awe of your ability to kind of just switch topics on, on, on the go like that in, in response to um, people's vote. So um, that was really fantastic and, uh, and really terrific to provide people with really practical ways forward as well in response to a topic that can, you know, sometimes be a bit bamboozling or, you know, that it's hard to know what to do about, right? So thank you for that. We we do have some um, questions. Uh, the, the first um, I'm going to read out from Akinori. Um, and uh, to, to kind of summarize, I think Akinori's uh, question is really about uh, that kind of focus on, well, what might be the positives in in having access to data? So, for instance, he gives one example of, you know, if if students are moving schools, for instance, um, may, you know, the, it, there might be real benefit in, in that student's data moving with them. Uh, there might, you know, and perhaps this is also part of kind of the rights and principles that sit behind data, um, that actually, you know, data can be used for good to to um, to improve people's outcomes and so on. So um, you did mention that you were a little bit negative, but um, yeah, what, what might be a more positive take or what might be some of the positive aspects of, of, of this data being available? Yeah, I think there are a lot of positives and I think you're right that that data can be used to travel with a student. But sometimes, you know, a student shifts schools for a fresh start as well. So it's not always, you know, a positive for that data to follow them. And I think we have a right, you know, for students to be able to start again. Um, I do realise this probably comes across as a little negative, but a lot of these projects are also looking at the positive ways that um, data is being used. Like one of the... Um, the options that I could have spoken about was how teachers are using data to get to know students in different ways. So through their background their, and their interests and often using the data that comes up through um, say attendance um, as a way of flagging or, or sort of being alerted to issues that they can then initiate a conversation with the student with. So definitely um, that that is a positive. So rather than the student having to come to the teacher, they can then, um, you know, the teacher might say, oh, look, I'm, I'm noticing something and then initiate the conversation. Um, of course, there's obviously ways around learning and assessment. In one of the schools that we um, uh, worked in, the, the way they use data now some may see this is the this is the thing. Some may view this positively. They do uh, an exercise at the beginning of the year where they use a lot of the students' early data or data from last year to predict what kind of outcome the student will get in their final exams. And the idea behind this is to kind of really push the student to kind of often it's not where the student thinks they want to be. So it's a way of trying to motivate the student. So you might say, well, that's a good use of data because it makes the student aware of um, the fact that um, they aren't going to do as well as what they thought, given this teacher's particular kind of algorithm to, to, to predict. But you could also say, well, that's not a great use of, of data because it's kind of using fear as a motivating force. So with many of these things, it's also a matter of perspective. So, I mean, data is not inherently bad. It's not inherently good. It's it's always what we do with it. So I think that's the kind of overriding message. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so Amanda Levito um, had a question. I think, Amanda, you were going to ask on microphone. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And thanks, Lucy, for that um, presentation. Um, I'm just interested, and you sort of, sort of started to talk about this towards the end of your presentation. So excuse me if it, you know, may be a little bit repetitive here. But I guess I was interested in the instances where either schools or teachers or the students were actively working in ways to kind of disrupt some of the data and platform practices that were happening in the schools. And if that kind of um, 
offered insight into a different way of um, thinking about digital literacies for those particular groups of people or institutions. Yeah, yeah, they did. And like that, that um, as part of the study screen, the student activity monitoring software example. Um, so the students had a whole range of ways of what they thought and I'm not sure how effective they were, but of sort of circumventing the study screen gaze. <laughs> so they would, you know, um, have like multiple kind of screens up or be, you know, using different, um, like so different browsers. And then one had a kind of complex way of thinking around um, uh, when something flicks up, then that means the teacher's looking at me. So some of them, some of them were were right and probably did work, but I think others were the students might have been a little bit hopeful. But always, you know, there were student there were workarounds sort of taking place. Um, the teachers, I think, were in in some ways in a slightly more difficult position because um, they were aware often of the gaze that was on them as well so um and and some of the the this is this is some of the the heart, the difficulty of doing this work as well is that um you often don't end up talking to the teachers who are outright resistors to it or who might be doing things completely differently because it's you know a gatekeeping kind of situation with with the school as well when you're negotiating access so i think in some ways it was a little more difficult for teachers apart from just simply resisting using, say, something like study screen. Um, and we this is look, this is just one platform that we looked at, but you know, in prior work, I'm sure that teachers are using, you know, these technologies in different ways. Um, or sorry, different different platforms in different ways. But I think so if we go back to the study screen example, that was quite tricky just because um, because the, the administration at the school could see how the teachers were using it as well. Great, thanks, Lucy. And um, and we have a question from Mimi Ito, um, who will come on camera. Thanks so much, Lucy, for a really thought provoking talk and you know a little uh, a tour through your research was really fantastic. Um, I was struck by sort of your manifesto and you know suggesting some ways to um, you know encourage critical analysis and literacy around the platform side. I guess. I'm wondering, I know this was probably tricky to do within the context of um, school. Uh, a lot of the folks we work with are, we do out of school stuff. So it may be easier to have these kind of critical conversations about schooling itself um, because these technologies are obviously being brought in for a certain purpose that's being pursued by school administrators, if not the teachers and um, you know, it's obviously easier to critique an external entity than your own classroom culture <laughs> and administrators, but it feels like very entwined to me that the responsibility mm -hmm. isn't just on the people building the technology, which certainly it is, but, you know, where the rubber hits the road for students is the fact that the schools endorse these approaches and are pushing these policies of surveillance and so on, which seems um, important somehow to, you know, acknowledge, especially the, at least in the U.S., the tendency for these systems to be applied unequally um, uh, for, you know, lower income and students of color and those kinds of structural dynamics seem really important and something that young people are pretty eager to engage with. And I'm just curious how kind of the critique of the structure of the technology can intersect with a more social, cultural and policy critique of um, schooling and inequality, or if you have any ideas or words of wisdom to throw our way. Um, yeah, no, I think um, that's actually what the, the, the project I've just started to work on is exactly that. So trying to look at the kind of um, bigger picture that is driving a lot of this. Um, and I think some of the issues with this kind of, you know, manifesto or, you know, this is what teachers should be doing is um, that actually we probably need to be speaking to those who are doing the procuring, who are, you know, kind of higher up developing the policies as well. Um, I guess uh, I think that there's kind of needs to be a bit of a bottom-up response from teachers 
uh, and also perhaps a more critical kind of understanding from um, policymakers and other intermediaries as well. But um, I think the governance of data in schools is very complex and I'm trying to get to grips with that in um, in Victoria alone, which is different to New South Wales and different again to Queensland. So, you know, even if you start sort of looking close, it's a, it has to be kind of a, a very local focused kind of study because I think you're absolutely right. These things are completely entangled and schools are... Um, here, and I'm pretty sure it happens in the States as well, uh, we have all these kind of league tables published on um, performance and even attendance publicly displayed. And so then there's this kind of punitive sort of uh, measures if schools aren't performing as they should be. So their solution then is to bring in the tech to kind of try and address it. But obviously it's a, it's a really complex picture. So um, I don't have any... Um, answers, but I think that that um, hopefully over the next couple of years I can find out a bit more about the kind of mechanics of the way that works. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. Thanks so much, Lucy. And and look, we're just past time now, so we do need to finish up there. But that once again, that was just such a really fantastic um, overview of your work, Lucy, and providing really deep insights into this such a, such an important topic. So thank you so much for being our keynote speaker. And um, I'd ask everyone to join with me in in thanking you, Lucy. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, it's been great. So really enjoyed it. All right. Thanks, everyone. And um, we look forward to seeing you in other sessions um, throughout the summit. Thank you.